Reading this morning comes from Psalms 33, verses 12 through 22. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he chose for his inheritance. From heaven the Lord looks down and sees all mankind. From his dwelling places he watches all who live on earth. He who forms the hearts of all, who considers everything they do. No king is saved by the size of his army. No warrior escapes by his great strength. A horse is a vain hope for deliverance. Despite all its great strength, it cannot save. But the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those whose hope is in his unfailing love, to deliver them from death and keep them alive in famine. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. Let us pray. Our God and Heavenly Father, how thankful, Father, that we are for the beautiful day and thankful, Father, for uh, the ability to be here this morning together. To know, Father, that you're always with us. To know that you're always answer our prayers and answer our needs and God how thankful we are for that and to know Father that we put our trust in you and that even though our our world is uh, affected by this virus Father we know that you're still in control of it all and God may we look to you and and pray to you for delivery from this virus, that there will be a cure found, that uh, you'll be with the doctors and all those that are scientists that are uh, trying to find a cure. But God, we're also know, Father, that you give us the strength that we need to be able to, to overcome anything that happens in this world. Father, we're thankful for everyone that's here in attendance today. I pray your blessing, continued blessing upon each and every one of us. We pray, Father, for those that are at home that are uh, watching this service, that we be of uh, an encouragement and uh, light and strength unto them. And God, how thankful we are for all that you do for us. But we thank you most of all for your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. This morning's meditation comes from Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 17. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are the, in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, 
They do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is su subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give you life to your mortal bodies because of his Spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but, is not, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his suffering, in order that we may also share in his glory. We are each one here today because we have been led by the Spirit. We are here today to be filled with God's Holy Spirit so that we can face the world where there is negativity in every conversation. There is despair on the faces of people. Do not live in fear because we who belong to God Almighty know that we will be protected by His Spirit. Ephesians 6.12 says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Before us today is the spiritual meal that Christ himself instituted. May it strengthen our spirits to be able to face this world to the glory of God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the eternal Holy Spirit. Go ahead and remove your communion from the packet. Go ahead and expose the bread. And let us pray. Dear God, Heavenly Father, how thankful, Father, that we are to be able to gather here this morning together to worship you, Father, in spirit and in truth, to sing songs of praise, to offer up prayers for those in need, to be around the Lord's table, as we're commanded to do, to hear a portion of your word proclaimed, and may we apply it to our lives, and to know, Father, that you are always with us. All we need to do is call upon you for what we need in this life. And you always respond to us. And God, as we prepare for communion, I pray that we recognize the bread as being Jesus' body that was whipped, beaten, nails that pierced his hands and feet, a crown of thorns forced upon his head, and a spear thrust in his side. But Father, he willingly gave his life for us. He knew what his mission was in this world and, and did it without any hesitation because it was your will that your son be the only sacrifice sufficient to take away the sins of the world. Father, how grateful we are for Jesus and what he's done for us upon the cross. Let us now partake of the bread. And go ahead and expose the cup. And Father, as we continue in prayer, may we recognize the cup as being the blood that was shed that day for our sin. God, we know and realize that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. 
how thankful we are for Jesus that he gave his life for us. But more importantly, that the grave did not hold our Savior, but on the third day he rose and later ascended to heaven where he is today at your right hand, making intercession for each and every one of us. God, how thankful we are for Jesus. By his sacrifice upon the cross, we have forgiveness of sin and the promise of eternal life. And how thankful, Father, we are for these promises to know that we too shall reside in heaven someday as long as we remain faithful. And God, may you strengthen us to be able to overcome the temptations in this world that we face. And so in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And uh, thank you, Jamie. She's working the controls uh, for our first service now. And uh, Eddie takes care of the second one. So we want to thank Jamie. She's always there to help any way she can. She takes care of our bulletin and uh, also one call and uh, along with uh, Debbie and uh, Sherry. So uh, you wear a lot of hats, Jamie, and we thank you so much. She's shaking her head, but... We know how good she does. Anywhere I go, uh, <clears throat> people read her column in the newspaper. Uh, I told her, and I mean it, uh, there have been times that I think about canceling my subscription to the paper, uh, but I'm not going to do it because Jamie's article's in it. And uh, <clears throat> so we have so many people here that do so much for us and uh, behind the scenes and even up front. Uh, but most of it's done behind the scenes. Almost all of our Christian work is done uh, on a daily basis, and we're just thankful for all of you who contribute to that as well. I could take each one of you aside this morning and uh, thank you for each thing that you do uh, for us. So, and that's the way it should be in the church. It's uh, uh, it's not a one-man band. It's it's a community uh, working together to make the Lord's work uh, grow. And as we worship together and fellowship together, uh, we'll all grow in Christ. Most of you know, um, Jamie, is this service being filmed today? Okay. The first service is being filmed. All right. So <clears throat> I'll go ahead then with the message. And we're grateful for all the people who are watching on Facebook, and we appreciate you who tune in uh, for that each week. Our scripture text this morning is taken from 1 Thessalonians chapter number 2. We're going to begin for our text in verse number 13. And we also thank God continually, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as a human word, but as it actually is, the word of God, which indeed is indeed at work in you who believe. For you, brothers and sisters, became imitators of God's churches in Judea, which are in Christ Jesus. You suffered from your own people the same things those churches suffered from the Jews who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and also drove us out. They displeased God and are hostile to everyone. In their effort to keep us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. In this way, they always heap up their sins to the limit. The wrath of God has come upon them at last. In this chapter 2 of 1 Thessalonians, the Apostle Paul is giving us marks of a Christian leader. 
A mark is something that you can see. Sometimes it may be on your clothing and you don't want it to be there, but it's still there. But sometimes a mark is a good thing to have because it identifies you. I remember years ago when we took the children down to Huntington and uh, to be there at Camden Park. Uh, sometimes they would put a little bracelet on the arm of each child designating that they paid to be there the whole day. And other times they would simply take a stamp and put it on their wrist and make a mark. And all of us who were there got that mark and that gave us all the rights and privileges to everything in the park uh, during that day. So sometimes a mark can be a very good thing. Well, a mark is something that identifies us. And we should be able to see, even as we saw the mark on the hands of those children when they went to Camden Park, we should be able to see the qualities or the marks of a Christian leader in ministers, in deacons, in elders, in teachers, and in every one of the Lord's people. But Paul is specifically talking here about leadership and his leadership and the leadership of the others in the church who help him. The first quality that he points out is being faithful. Let's read this in verses 1 through 6. You know, brothers and sisters, that our visit to you was not without results. We had previously suffered and been treated outrageously in Philippi, as you know, but with the help of our God, we dared to tell you his gospel in the face of strong opposition. For the gospel we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please people, but God, who tests our hearts. You know we never used flattery, nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. We were not looking for praise from people, not from you or anyone else, even though as apostles of Christ, we could have asserted ourselves or our authority. Instead, we were like young children among you. The apostle pointed out that he and the others were faithful in the middle of persecution. There are many times that he felt like giving up, but he wouldn't give up. He said in verse 4, as we noticed, it's better to be approved by God and not applauded by men. So many times today we measure our success by the applause of people. But you can't do that in the church. Those of us who are trying to live godly, holy, separate lives will often not be applauded. Even though we're quite capable in our field, even though we may be good neighbors and good workers. I say to our teenagers, I've said it to them over the years, you're just as good looking, you're just as talented, you're just as witty. You can do anything anybody else does, maybe even in a superior way, but there's always going to be a time somewhere that you're not going to receive applause if you're a Christian. People are not going to like that. And that's the way it was with the apostle and all of those who worked with him, but they were still faithful. He said, God tests our hearts. People look on the outward appearance, the things we can be, the things we can do, the things we can contribute, but God looks at our hearts. And Paul said, we didn't resort to flattery. We didn't try to just say nice things to you to make you like us. He didn't resort to greed. In fact, he tells how he worked very hard physically so that he wouldn't have to charge them for the preaching of the gospel. 
So he said there was no flattery, no greed, and expected no praise. He said, we are not trying to please people, but God. And when you and I try to please God, everything's going to be all right. We noticed here that this faithfulness was under persecution, as he already mentioned in the first six verses, and also strong opposition. Mike very aptly brought it out in the communion devotion today. The church is going to see more and more strong opposition from the world. And we need to be prepared for it. Are we going to be faithful in the midst of that strong opposition? All Christians should be, but especially God's leaders as they're leading God's church. A second quality or a mark of a Christian leader that the Apostle Paul mentions is simply gentle. Now this word is not a favorite word on the American scene. Americans are very aggressive people. They're very practical people. Uh, Americans are doers usually uh, more than they are visionaries, although they are most of the time both. But Americans like to get things done. And sometimes in getting things done, you kind of have to ride roughshod over other people. So gentleness is usually not looked upon as the road to success. And maybe even in some churches, gentleness is not looked upon as the road uh, to success. But that's how you get into people's hearts. Let's uh, read the words here in verses 7 through 9 regarding being gentle. He said, instead, we were like young children among you, just as a nursing mother cares for her children. So we cared for you because we loved you so much. We were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Surely you remember, brothers and sisters, our toil and hardship. We work night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preach the gospel of God to you. Paul said, we were gentle like a mother is to her children. And he said, we cared for you. Now, that's what a good mother does. She cares for her children. And he said, we cared for you not only by sharing the gospel. So that's an interesting point there for all of us. If we really care for people, we will share the gospel with them. But he said, we not only shared the gospel, but we shared our lives as well. But he also pointed out in verse 12 that not only were they like a mother, but they were also like a father to the church, caring for the church. And he said the father encourages in verse 12. The father comforts. The father urges a life worthy of God. And that's what a good father on earth does for us trying to direct us to achieve everything that we can for our own good. My father never did tell me what I should be or what I should do in life. He did tell me a few things that he wished that I wouldn't do as far as my career. He said, first of all, though, he said, to do something you like. And he said, I wish that you didn't have to work in the factory like me. And what he did was sort of like what the Apostle Paul did, and like many of your fathers did as well. He worked in the factory. He had another business on the side, which grew at one time enough that he had to leave the factory and take care of it. But he worked night and day for all of us. <clears throat> and when I was starting to get interested in the ministry, even though my father was not in the church. He always tried to encourage me in the church, but he encouraged me even to be a minister. And so a father encourages, a father comforts, and tries to urge us to do what is right. 
Now we know we can't make anybody do something they don't want to do. And as the word is being sent forth in a church service like this, the Bible is trying to encourage us to do what's right. You know, we think now about, we hear a lot about uh, the, uh, the shots that we're supposed to take for COVID, the vaccine, and uh, we know that the federal government, local officials, and our own physicians are encouraging people to be sure to get their vaccines because it'll help them. And it certainly helped Betty and me when we did get COVID. We had a very mild form of it compared to the people who are now in hospitals and on vents. But here again, we try to encourage people, the doctors do, the government does. But we urge people, but we can't force people to do something that they feel is harmful for them. And indeed, there are certain individuals, and we've got to think about this when we make judgments and that type of thing. There are certain individuals, because of their health conditions and on certain medications that they take, they're not un they are unable to take the vaccine. But we do urge those who are able to do so. There is a vaccine, spiritually speaking, that we would like people to take. And that is the gospel of Christ. This vaccine is brought about not by any type of physical medication. But it's done by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. By obeying the plan of salvation. By repenting of our sins and being immersed in water to wash away those sins. By doing like what you are doing here in this service today, being faithful to God in your service and worship to him. So we see that they worked night and day not to be a burden in verses 7 through 9. Now let's notice another thing or quality or mark of a Christian leader. And that is blameless. Follow along with me in verses 10 through 12. You are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. Blameless does not mean perfection. There's no human leader in the church who is perfect. Our only leader who is perfect is the Lord Jesus Christ. So then what does blameless mean? It sounds like you're saying you don't do anything wrong. So if, if we are guilty of doing things wrong, what does blameless mean? Blameless means we try with all of our heart to do what is right. And when we do wrong, we try to make it right. We ask for forgiveness. We make amends. We do all that we can to fix a situation when we are the ones who are in the wrong. So many times, and the Apostle Paul addressed this, and Jesus himself did too, we tell people what they must do. In other words, we as teachers and preachers say, do as I say. But blameless means do what we do. Are we living in such a life that others can follow us and still be on the right road? You know, I've had people follow me on a road before. I thought I knew where I was going, and, and I was going the wrong direction until I finally recognized it and pulled off, and we figured out the right route to take. So are people going to heaven because of our example can they follow us to our church, hear the gospel, know what to do to go to heaven? Can they follow us at work, 
and know what Jesus wants us to do in our daily lives. So he said we were holy, we were righteous, we were blameless among you. Our Lord Jesus said this in the Beatitudes. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. I hope that everybody in the church has that kind of hunger and thirst and appetite for righteousness. The last thing that I want to mention this morning as far as a mark or quality of a Christian leader is that they're hopeful. You know, in this time of distress that we are under now in our country and in the world, whether we are church leaders or political leaders or whatever type of leadership we're in, maybe we're the head of a company, the CEO, or we're in charge of an office somewhere, one of the things leaders can do is instill hope in people. When we think of our previous wars and some of the leaders who came out of those wars, whether they be presidents or prime ministers or maybe they were uh, leaders in our army and navy and air force and marines, generals, they were people who saw where they needed to go and they were very focused on that. So leaders today instill hope, even when it appears that there is no hope. You know, Paul says in this section about hope that he wanted to come and see them, but Satan blocked the way. We'll read about it here in verses 17 to 20. Satan is always blocking the way of the church. And it's easy to get discouraged and think, well, the church is going nowhere. We're not making any progress. But Satan's always blocking the way. That's what Paul said. But leaders can still provide hope. Let's start with verse number 17. But brothers and sisters, when we were orphaned by being separated from you for a short time in person, not in thought, out of our intense longing, we made every effort to see you. For we wanted to come to you. Certainly I, Paul, did again and again. But Satan blocked our way. He doesn't say how. But I think you and I can look at times in our lives when Satan blocked our way. For what is our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes. Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and joy. Any of us who care enough to minister to others experience this. Whether you stand in the pulpit or not. The people that you have led to Christ are your glory, joy, and crown. That's what makes ministry so wonderful. Is because the result of it is the people who come to God, they are glory, joy, and crown. And I want to close with verses 13 through 16 because this is the church's response to good leadership. This is how the church responds to good leadership. And we, again, as I said in the opening text, we also thank God continually because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it. You know, a preacher can stand and a teacher can stand and an elder can stand before a church and tell everybody what they need to do and how they ought to do it. But the thing that really makes you happy is when somebody accepts it. It's willing to do 
what the Bible says. So he said, you accepted it, not as human word. There's a lot of nice words that you can pick up on the internet, uh, encouragement, some of them it's poetry, some of it's psychology, some of it is philosophy, some of it is just everyday normal advice. But you see, when we go to church, we don't want any human word. He said, but as it actually is, the word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. So this morning, I'm thankful to be among people who accept the word and are doing the word. And I pray that God will help us this week to accomplish that in our lives every single day. We're going to stand now for our closing hymn of invitation.